Welcome to SpyCast, the official podcast of the International Spy Museum. I'm Aaron Dietrich, your host, Dr. Andrew Hammond's content partner. Coming up next on SpyCast. There are lots of examples of, of people being inspired uh, to go into intelligence because of their interest in in spies that was that came from popular culture. I mean, one of my favorite examples of this is actually Vladimir Putin. <laughs> On April 13th, 1953, Ian Fleming published the first James Bond novel, Casino Royale. He would go on to publish a new book in the Bond series annually, culminating in 12 novels and two short story collections. Now, 70 years later, the franchise has grown to include 25 movies featuring six different actors portraying James Bond. This week on SpyCast, curators Andrew and Alexis Albion join forces to put the past 70 years of Bond into historical perspective. To help frame their conversation, our collections team, Laura and Lauren, brought out a fantastic selection of Bond artifacts for Andrew and Alexis to interact with during the recording of this episode. If you enjoy the show, please tell your friends and loved ones. Please also consider leaving us a five-star review. The original podcast on intelligence since 2006, we are 17 years strong. We are SpyCast. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Well, um, I'm so pleased to do this episode on the anniversary of James Bond and I think I've got the perfect guest to do it with, uh, my colleague Alexis Albion. So I think that would be good to start off, Alexis. Uh, let's discuss your favourite movie, No Time to Die, and the bionic eye that we have, which is a prop from the movie in our collection. Uh, I'm being playful, of course. Um, tell us about your interpretation of No Time to Die. Well, <laughs> that's a loaded question, if ever I uh, I heard one. Um, well, my interpretation of it, I yeah, you know, I guess it's the um, I am I, I can't say anything that hasn't probably been already written about in many many magazines and blogs and websites and so on. Clearly, it's the last Daniel Daniel Craig movie and um, kind of the the coda um, in a string of Craig films. Um, and, you know, spoiler, spoiler, James Bond dies at the end, uh, which is the, the big surprise. And, you know, I, I think it's the, it's, it sort of finishes that arc um, of the Craig films. Obviously, Bond's emotional journey has been the, the big feature of the Craig films. And, and that's a, a large part of No Time to Die, um, his relationship and, you know, coming to an end and sort of him putting f family, actually, <laughs> above um, his own self is, you know, the denouement of Bond. Um, it's hard, you know, not to sort of take a step back and see, you know, if... If Craig has to leave, then then Bond has to die as well, um, which is one way of looking at it. I must say, it isn't my favourite, um, and I'm not sure. I'm, I'm I still have a lot of inner conflict about that particular ending, but you know, it is what it is. I think it'll be really interesting to see how the series gets rebooted afterwards, because we know it is. And uh, if you stayed in the cinema till the bitter end, as I did after I saw No Time to Die in the movies, waiting to see if Bond returns, uh, which is always on the screen at the end of any Bond film, indeed he does. So it'll be interesting to see how that series is rebooted with not just with Bond, um, but, you know, maybe with the whole cast of characters, because it's hard to see continuity <laughs> after No Time to Die when James Bond is dead. Uh, so uh, we'll have to reboot it. We'll have to start from some point, um, just as the, the Craig series did with Casino Royale. And I, I'm really interested to see, to see where they start from. 
Yeah, me How too. How about you, Andrew? <laughs> What's your interpretation of No Time to Die? You don't get to just throw out that question without having it thrown back at you. But, well, uh, I mean, there's a few things that I want to pick up on okay. there, but one of them um, is where does Daniel Craig rank for you in the list of James Bonds? Oh, God. Another hard question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have to put Sean Connery first because... You know, that's where my heart is. I think Daniel Craig has been terrific. I, I mean, I'm not... Number two. Uh, uh, it's it's really hard because I think Casino Royale, the first Daniel Craig films, is in, you know, the top five of all the Bond films. I think it's a fantastic movie and I think he's amazing in it. I have to say after that, it, mm, nothing really lives up to Casino Royale for me. Um, so, But on the basis of Casino Royale alone, I think... Um, I think he might come second. Roger Moore is not exactly my taste, though, you know, I realise that he is for some. Connery is more my taste, so he's number one. Oh, we'll go with Craig number two. And then I guess we have to go with Roger Moore number three just because, well, he's so likeable and charming and had such a run of films. And then uh, I guess Pierce Brosnan. I know I'm leaving out George Lazenby and uh, Timothy Dalton. Mm. It's hard because they, they obviously, Lazenby only did one film and and uh, Dalton too. So oh, we'll give them equal, equal last place. I think that's one of the interesting things about the Bond series because they've been gone for so long. There's different generations have attached themselves to different Bonds. And, yeah. you know, there's a Olympian movie critic view of all of this, right? Which one makes the most aesthetic sense, has the best acting the best script and stuff but sometimes it's just I was a kid and this was my bond that I grew up with and I don't really care what the critics say this Absolutely. is this is my favorite so there's there's both the objective and the subjective going on here right yeah absolutely and you know I do think you put too much thought into it and it, it sort of spoils things so I, I like that subjective you know just what you feel and it, it might be the first Bond movie you saw and who starred in it, and that's fine. So just to go back to your to go back to your question, Alexis. Yes. So I really enjoyed the movie. I thought it was a good movie. When it got to the end, I guess I had some existential anxiety because I thought, what happens in a world without James Bond? Because it's all I've ever known. My whole life, James Bond has been in the background of of the culture. And then I'm wondering Maybe you have some thoughts on this. He does reappear, so can can he come back? Is, is Bond really dead? Or what is the franchise all about if there's no James Bond? Is it about 007? And is 007 a strong enough platform to lay a movie franchise on? And I'm also thinking, you know, it's a huge gamble, right? It's the most successful movie franchise in history. Uh, why kill the golden goose but then there's also and we're going to go on to discuss this there's certain cultural contradictions in the Bond franchise when Fleming wrote the books uh, the, the 50s and the 60s it was a very different culture just in terms of gender class, uh, imperialism and so forth so I think that increasingly and this comes up in one of the movies I think is, is it M uh, Judy Dench says you know you're a dinosaur from the Cold War so there's this kind of sense that Bond is increasingly backed into a corner in terms of his cultural norms and the cultural norms of the audience that are watching him. So I don't know where it's going to go. I'm kind of excited to see, but I really hope that the franchise doesn't die off because it's clearly one for the ages. Even if it, even if it's stopped now, it's like the Beatles. It's just, it's going to live on. Uh, so those are some of the thoughts that I had on it. Mm. I think, you know, the Bond films, you're right, the different films, different eras have sort of reflected, you know, different social, cultural, political themes of the times. So, you know, this existential crisis <laughs> that you experience <laughs> with no time to die, I mean, you know, Sounds maybe it's a reflection dramatic. of our times, <laughs> frankly. We've been going through sort of an existential crisis. I, was, I know the film was made before COVID, but, you know, Bond has always been good at anticipating some of the themes uh, of, our, of our day. So maybe it's appropriate in a way that you feel that and we, we feel that and we're, we're sort of going through this reckoning 
the moment, you know, who am I? What do I want? What makes me happy? Do we need bond? And so on. So maybe it's appropriate in that sense. Um, the other thing is, you know, um, th this idea of continuity was sort of changed with with Casino Royale, with the Craig era. I mean, there was always this sense that we, we know that um, the actors change, but there was always this idea of, of some continuity going on so that you get references to Bond's past from other films and other experiences. And that all stopped with Craig, who again rebooted it when we saw the early Bond, you know, Bond learning to be Bond in Casino Royale, which I think they did wonderfully. So there is a precedent in that sense for not having continuity. Now, also, there is a precedent for Bond dying, or maybe not dying, in the, the Fleming books. Um, he only lived twice in the novel, Bond. Actually, the, the, the novel begins with Bond being, being dead, but of course, he's not dead. Um, and there's an, it begins with an obituary of Commander Bond. And then we find out he's not actually dead. I don't think that's going to be the case for this film. It's really hard to see how Bond comes back from this particular death, an island exploding. I mean, it's a possibility. I think that would be a disappointment in a way because I think the film meant to kill him definitively. So um, I think he's dead. But... I don't think that means he can't come back again at a different point in time. And, and that's the, it's sort of an open book now. The writers, you know, can, can, bring, can bring him back at any point. Again, it could be in the midst of his career, the beginning of his career, whatever they want. And that'll be really interesting to see. Um, but I, uh, I don't think Bond is dead, as you said. I think he's shown an amazing ability to adapt to the times and... I believe the success of the last film and others uh, means that I, I think it's very unlikely to uh, to stop having that to, to stop the movies. The the franchise, frankly, is just too successful and makes too much money. Bear with me on this. So, uh, it also, it seems to me that Bond is he's often called like you know English or or British and a, a term that people use when they're describing someone who's English they use British but it seems to me that he's British in the more thoroughgoing sense of the term so Ian Fleming's grandfather was a, a Scottish came down to England the family made money um, Fleming starts moving in a particular social milieu uh, the first Bond Sean Connery uh, then Fleming goes on to write Bond's backstory which is half Swiss half Scottish uh, but then you know recently during the Daniel Craig era We've had the Scottish National Party be the majority party in Scotland. Uh, even my home constituency went from being the safest seat in the entire UK for Labour to becoming an SNP seat, which I never thought would have happened in my lifetime. So I wonder all about the Daniel Craig era of Bond. I wonder if there's also something going on there underneath about the nature of Britain or British identity or or a British figure. So when uh, Scotland and England, the Union of the Crowns in 1606, uh, James VI of Scotland and uh, First of England, and then a century later, 1707, the Union of the Parliaments. So there's no such thing really as a British national identity. So there's a great book, uh, Linda Colley, a historian, Forging a Nation, uh, and she talks about how British national identity was forged around the ideas of uh, the royal family, the empire, um, trade, opposition to Catholicism on the European continent and so forth. So all those things that held British identity together, you could make an argument that a lot of them have dissolved and Bond is born in the high watermark of all of this, the Second World War, the good war. Ian Fleming's an intelligence officer then. This is where a lot of the ideas that he goes on to use come from, so... I'm probably reading massively too much into it, but I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, Bond is quintessentially British, as you said. There have been attempts <laughs> to have, you know, an, an American Bond, let's say, and and uh, and other countries as well, but they're not Bond. They're just, you know, they're 
just a, attempts to copy some of that formula. The, the Britishness of Bond is, is part of who he is. And I think that's still true. Um, it's, it's been true in the last few films. You think of even the settings in London, the symbols, the, the bulldog, the flag, the, the, the crown and so on. There's, it's still rife with those, those figures, those symbols. So I think his Britishness is essential. Again, yeah, I mean, that sort of changed. I think he's adapted to different maybe interpretations or uh, different concerns about, about British identity, patriotism and so on over the years. I mean, interestingly, the actors who have played Bond have, you know, we've had obviously Connery Scottish, <laughs> though I, I read that you know, he, one of the things I liked about Connery, I found because they were thinking about the film, it was important for that film to appeal to American audiences as well as, as British audiences. I thought his accent was kind of mid-Atlantic, you know, <laughs> wasn't too British, but would, would sort of appeal broadly. But, you know, he's, a, he was, he's Scottish. Um, and we have... Uh, George Lazenby, who is, of course, Australian, part of the British Empire. <laughs> then we've got quintessentially English Roger Moore. Who am I missing here? Timothy Dalton. Timothy Dalton, who's Welsh, I believe. And then um, Pierce Brosnan is Irish. <laughs> and then back to Craig, who's English. So we, we kind of have covered, you know, the whole United Kingdom there. And, and Ireland. Um, and also, again, it will be very interesting to see who they choose. And, you know, maybe that, maybe this is just a coincidence because they've certainly gone for the best actor of the job, but they have covered that whole range. And it would be fascinating to see um, who is chosen next and whether they reflect, you know, a degree of, of diversity of Britishness uh, with that, that next actor, whoever that might be. I, I don't think it'll be American. <laughs> um, I think they will be British, but, you know, I don't know. British Indian would be really interesting, wouldn't it? It really would. Mm. I was just thinking lighter, Felix lighter, mm, doesn't have a... quite the same ring to it, does it? No, he's, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what the listeners don't know is that we've got a table beside us with some of our holdings that relate to James Bond. Some of them are, are merchandise from the movies. Some of them are, are based on cigarettes that Ian Fleming had Bond smoke from the place where he got them made in Moorlands in London. We have the book, uh, the, the name James Bond, where it comes from. We have a number of other artifacts here, but just before we go on to those, Alexis, like at the Spy Museum, most people's ideas of espionage that come through our doors, their ideas really come from movies, from popular culture. And that's just, that's just the way it is. So we're in this place where we meet them there and then we're trying to inform them about the real world of intelligence and espionage and you get some people that are involved in the real world of intelligence and espionage that pour a lot of cold water on bond and are quite dismissive of it but actually the, the, the links are really really interesting Ian Fleming was a former intelligence officer of course but here in our collection we've got the John Walker case the code for which was 007. We have a Walther PPK that belonged to Robert Hansen because Robert Hansen was a huge James Bond fan. I can think of another couple of dozen examples like this off the top of my head. So I know that this is something that you've studied in the past. So just before we move on to the rest of the artifacts, the real world of intelligence and espionage and Bond help us understand that connection between them. Well, yeah, I think Sometimes people think there's this impervious wall between fact and fiction um, in intelligence, and that's simply not true. Um, we know that uh, intelligence officers read spy novels and, and go and, and see, you know, TV shows about spies and movies, perhaps more than, than most people because they're interested in that topic. And, um, you know, there are lots of examples of, of people being inspired uh, to go into intelligence because of their um, interest in, in spies that was, came from popular culture. I mean, one of my 
favorite examples of this is actually Vladimir Putin, <laughs> who was uh, so inspired by a, a, a Soviet spy movie um, and has actually, you know, claimed that that's what really got him interested in this idea of sort of serving this cause bigger than himself and so on. But there's lots of examples of, of that. And, uh, and I think it's th this idea that, oh, that's, that's fiction and this is reality, that they're two completely separate worlds is not realistic, frankly. And, you know, the, the, the public learns a lot about intelligence, what they, they think happens in the intelligence world, who spies are, how they act, you know, intelligence officers from watching TV and reading books and, and seeing movies. And of course they do. How would they not? <laughs> I mean, the intelligence world isn't exactly hugely forthcoming in trying to educate the public <laughs> about what intelligence really is and what it does. That's what we do here at the Spy Museum. But I think we feel that really, that, that big gap, frankly, of trying to explain what intelligence is and, and what the realities are. But of course, most of our visitors walk into this building you know, with ideas in their heads about who spies are and how they act, even if they kind of know that's not, that's not really true. And, um, and I think that those expectations and assumptions, it's really important to recognize those. And there's, again, lots of examples of how that kind of spills over into the real world. I've studied the 1960s, um, which is the era when Bond really just explodes in popular culture internationally. And one of my favorite examples, there's a great article about uh, popularity of Bond in, in Italy at this time, and they did these, this questionnaire um, that came out in an Italian magazine, or I think it was a, an article, sorry, in an Italian magazine about spies and things, and they, and they got all these um, the letters coming in from the public asking questions about spies and, and about becoming intelligence agent with very specific questions which are clearly influenced by popular culture like you know do i get an expense account you know exactly how many people do i have to kill in a year i mean they're clear and these are serious questions and they were obviously inspired by the movies and i think to ignore that influence is uh, just you know is re ignoring the reality of how people learn about what intelligence is and what intelligence officers do. So I think, as you put it, nicely meeting the public and our visitors where they are is really important in that sense and saying, look, you know, we understand what your expectations are and where it comes from, but now let's, let's break that down a little bit and let's start showing you what the reality of in the intelligence world really is. And that's what we do at the museum. And we fill that educational space which I think is a, is a really important role. Oscar Wilde once said that life imitates art far more than art imitates life. In the case of James Bond, I think we can agree it's a little bit of both. Both the novels and the films borrow heavily from real life. Ian Fleming is said to have based many of the characters in the Bond franchise after people he knew during his time in naval intelligence most notably gaining inspiration for the character M from his own boss, Admiral John Godfrey. Casino Royale was directly inspired by one of Fleming's wartime trips to Portugal, when, after leaving a packed casino one night, Fleming reportedly said to Godfrey, what if those men had been German Secret Service agents, and suppose we had cleaned them out of their money? Now that would have been exciting, end quote. Real life has often seemed to take a page out of Bond's book as well. Just ahead in this episode, Andrew and Alexis will discuss the links between some of Bond's famous gadgets and real spy tools used in the field. And while MI6 has yet to adopt Bond's invisible car, I, for one, still hold out hope. Just to start digging into the artifacts a little bit more, so this eye that we have, a bionic eye, it's a prop on loan from Eon Productions who've been involved with all, all of the movies. And, and just going on to how the real world of espionage and popular culture intersect, to me, this is basically 
th there's a strong connection here to the the growing fusion between human beings and and machines or uh, synthetic or artificial materials uh, which are often called cybernetic organisms or cyborgs so this is something we're increasingly seeing where people are getting uh, implants or machines that can augment the way in which they interact with the world and this eye in the movie it helps you record, see, audio, visual uh, material and then in the movie this goes to Blofeld who's in prison and through this eye Blofeld can be somewhere that he physically isn't. So I'm not saying that we have something exactly like this but this is the general trend that we're heading in in terms of uh, espionage, tradecraft and so forth. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, this is, you know, the the gadgets, the technology in Bond. I think it doesn't work unless it's credible in some sense. And and we do know that, at least in the films, you know, sometimes the, uh, the, the Bond films have been ahead of their time <laughs> in terms of technology. My favorite example of this is in From Russia with Love. At the very beginning of the film, we see Bond canoodling by the banks of a, of a river in somewhere in England, and his satellite phone or his car phone goes off. Actually, it's not a satellite phone, it's a pager, um, goes off in his car. Um, and of course, he has to answer that and it's calling him back to headquarters for a mission. Um, and it's a huge thing. <laughs> it's probably about, I don't know, a foot and a half long or something like that. It, it looks like a, a, one of those sort of satellite phones from the 90s. It's actually a pager and it was a prototype. And, you know, at that time that was, wow, really cutting edge technology. And I, I think the Bond films have, have been innovative in that sense. And again, I think it doesn't work if it's so outlandish. People say, oh, I couldn't possibly be. I've had a few examples of that, you know, invisible car. It's, we won't talk about that too much, though, you know, you can find things that say, oh, well, you know, it's kind of feasible in this sense, mirrors and so on. But the, um, the, the bionic eye, <laughs> no time to die, I think we can all sort of say, yeah, I can I can see that, right? I mean, I'm I'm not sure if if it's um if it how feasible it really is. I I doubt if such a thing exists today, but I think we can kind of, you know, see, yeah, I, I can see how that might work. Now we do have an eyeball in the museum on display. Um it's actually a concealment device uh from I believe the World War II era. It's uh, you know, if you had a, a cat, you have a cavity there. If you didn't have an eyeball, uh, that's a great place to hide something. And it's sort of a fake eyeball that goes on top there. Um, so there is some precedent in using the body, right, to, um, to conceal things. We certainly have a number of examples of that in the museum. But this idea of a, uh, a bionic eye that uh, allows, you know, you to sort of remotely s spy on somebody, it's a, both a camera and a, an audio device, or a bug, basically. I, I, I guess you can see that as, <laughs> as one step toward our becoming cyborgs. But, you know, the Bond movies have been, have used that for, for a long, long time since Dr. No, who had a, a prosthetic arm, right, which was a hook. That's and a then we point. can think of other examples. Jaws is obviously <laughs> one that comes to mind. So I think there's been some precedence in that case, and uh, and this is kind of the latest in technology. It's a great little piece here that we've got. It's sort of definitely, I think, the most memorable piece of technology from that film. And it's, it's quite interesting to me. So the way that the villain dies is mm. because Bond has a watch that emits an electromagnetic pulse, and this is something that's actually from the real world of intelligence, espionage, national security. You can get nuclear weapons that send out electromagnetic pulses to try to 
basically disable uh, the other side's ability mm -hmm. to communicate with itself and um, these types of things so there's always a kernel of truth in there otherwise it's just completely outlandish it's not believable at all but I mean even thinking about self-driving cars I can't remember which uh, Pierce Brosnan movie it is but he's got the little remote control and yep. self-driving mm -hmm. his car now you can get a, you can go and lease a Hyundai get out of the car and it will reverse park it for you <laughs> to save you having to spend five Five minutes completely butchering the operation yourself yeah. so in some ways I think the people are often, often pour a lot mm. of cold water again on these movies but I think in quite often they're presaging technological developments that are coming down the line that the general public aren't aware of I would contest that quite often this might be the first place where they encounter this type of stuff yeah and I think the the genre in general of spy of the spy genre always has to have one f one foot, often two, in the real world. It's part of what makes that genre appealing and not science fiction. It takes place in the real world. And whether that is, you know, some of the technology or um, real world threats, it, it has to be relatable, I think, and recognizable in that sense. It's part of what makes um, the spy film that fits into that whole genre. And I think that's what we like about it. And again, it's a fictional space for thinking about, talking about those tensions, those international tensions in national security that, you know, most of us, most people don't get to discuss all the time or even think about. And it's kind of a safe space where you, we can explore those tensions. And that's, I think, what spy fiction is all about. And yeah, I, I think being ahead of its time, cutting edge, you know, I, I think we'd like to think that our intelligence agencies are on the cutting edge, right? And do have technology which which we don't have anymore. Well, oh, oh, sorry, anymore. We don't have at the moment. And we like to think that they're a few steps ahead of us, I think, that makes us feel better about our national security. And so I think in that sense, again, it's credible to think, oh, wow, they've got some cool stuff, you know, that I haven't seen yet. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is important. And, and, yeah, I mean, there's, again, there are actually examples from the movies of them using actual prototypes that hadn't been released yet, that weren't on the market yet. And I think there's another example that I came across, and I think it's Bill Casey, the CIA director under Ronald Reagan. And I think he goes to watch a Bond movie and comes across biometric, and apparently he comes out and says what the heck is this stuff you know we need to get on top of it so there is this yeah. <laughs> this interplay between fact and fiction and of course we have one of John F. Kennedy's favourite books was from Russia with Love we have a copy of it here yeah. uh, in the museum and you know John Amendez former CIA chief of disguise good friend in the museum um, has certainly told us that um, she would come to work the night after Mission Impossible, a really popular TV show, had been on and with lots of innovative technology and especially disguise. And, uh, and her team, you know, would get asked, hey, can we do that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, after having seen something on TV? And she certainly told us that. So I think, yeah, some, you know, the movies, TV, they're sometimes ahead of reality and reality is inspired. So I guess, again, it's its not as simple as just fact and fiction. There is a sort of a relationship there between them. They borrow from each other. And I think I also recall the KGB. I, I remember reading somewhere that after a Bond movie would come out, they would watch it and, and then they would be saying to themselves, you know, does the West really have this or, or is this something that we can do or, you know, what, what's going on here? So it also plays this interest in mediating role in the Cold War as well, I think. But just to go back to your point about one foot in fact and one foot in, in fiction, Ian Fleming is the perfect example, right? Naval intelligence officer. And then he goes on to become an author and writes all these James Bond novels. So... Mm. Ian Fleming was born to a wealthy family in London on May 28, 1908. He was educated at some of the finest institutions in England and across Europe, but was never known to be the highest achiever or brightest scholar in his class. He much preferred skipping class and spending his time on sports, 
driving cars, and solidifying his reputation as a womanizer. You can see where some Bond inspiration came from. After a decade of work as a journalist and later a banker, Fleming was recruited into the Naval Intelligence Division during World War II. He was directly involved in Operation Mincemeat, a deception operation aimed at disguising the Allied invasion of Sicily, Operation Ruthless, a covert attempt to gain access to German naval enigma codes, and yes, Operation Goldeneye, which was a real operation devised by Fleming that outlined the plan to monitor Spain during the Second World War. He died at the young age of 56 years old, but left behind an indelible mark on the world that continues to grow even today. In part two of this episode, Andrew and Alexis take a closer look at Fleming's life and his inspirations, aided by a 1966 Life magazine. We'll release the second half of this episode next week, but for now, please enjoy the rest of part one. Let's go on to the beginning of that story and Fleming going to Jamaica, writing the books, and then this book that we have here, uh, Birds of the West Indies. Um, so could you just tell us a little bit more about that and and about why this is important for the story of James Bond? Well, because Fleming himself has a ba- had a background in intelligence, and so we know that he was writing or well, with a certain knowledge <laughs> of of intelligence in his head. It's been during World War II, naval intelligence, and there's been all this interest in looking and and trying to find elements in in Fleming's novels, like this was inspired by this, this was based on this, whether it's characters or missions and everything. And one of the interesting questions is, who's James Bond? Who inspired Fleming to write this character? And the name itself, James Bond, People were interested, where does that come from? And luckily, I think Fleming's really put that to rest. Um, he himself said that uh, he, was, he had this book, Field Guide of Birds of the West Indies, authored James Bond. Um, and he chose that name, James Bond, because he literally thought it was the most dull and boring name possible. I uh, thought it just sounded dull. And he thought, that's... That's the name I want for my character. Um, so that's apparently where he took that name of James Bond. That's what Fleming said. Fleming said lots of things, and that doesn't mean that people necessarily believe him. But, I, for example, there's been lots of speculation about where 007 comes from, lots of speculation as to whether James Bond was based on a real person or not. And and um, it drives me absolutely mad, I have to tell you. It's one of those <laughs> things that I just cannot stand because you'll see it everywhere, you know, certain people. Uh, he was the inspiration for James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't, you know, I don't think we'll ever really know. And I believe that Fleming might have said at some point he was an amalgamation, which seems to make sense to me. He really wasn't based on any one person. Uh, but... We know that the name, and I, I, I think that this, it makes a lot of sense, came from the book I'm holding in my hand right now um, by James Bond. And, and it's quite interesting because Fleming, just for our listeners that don't know, he buys some land in the north coast of Jamaica. He builds an estate that goes on to become the Golden Eye Estate. Mm. Uh, he writes, I think, all of the books there. Yes. He spends... He wrote one a year. One a that year. That was his, his schedule. I believe he was working at the Times, um, at the London newspaper. And he would take off time during the winter go to his estate in Jamaica with his wife. And he had a routine of getting up early in the morning, going for a swim, you know, writing for a number of hours. Not that many. <laughs> um, churning out a certain number of, wor- uh, of, of words or pages every day. And that's what he did continuously. He wrote these quite quickly on his typewriter <laughs> in Jamaica. Didn't work too hard at it. And he, he, he managed to churn out one a year. Wow. And I have this quote here, actually, um, that I believe this is what Fleming wrote to the widow of the James Bond that wrote the book Field Guide of Birds of the West Indies. He said, it struck me that this brief, unromantic, Anglo-Saxon and yet very masculine name was just what I needed. And so a second James Bond was born. 
Nice. Which I think is <laughs> pretty nice. And actually, just the other week, I was uh, rereading um, Dr. No, the novel. And in Dr. No, one of the parts of that book is that uh, there's an island off the coast of Jamaica, which is a place where lots of guano is, which is basically bird poo. Um, and there's this whole part of the novel where there's a couple of members of the American Audubon Society, uh, like a bird watching, bird preservation society. They go to this island and they disappear. And the Audubon Society have a very powerful lobby that's, you know, involved in preserving and looking after birds in, in the, the Western Hemisphere and so forth. So so this actually does creep into the to the novels as well. And, and Dr. No, the Audubon Society, uh, bird watching, mm. ornithology. In Jamaica, of course. Jamaica, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah v- v- very, very fascinating. And I think that this is a good point to jump on to the 007 question. Because as I understand it, the James Bond one is more or less, you know, we could probably find a couple of other places, but more or less this one is put to bed. But the 007, this is much more of a of a reading the tea leaves uh, one. So let's let's go on to that. And one of the artifacts that we have here is is uh, one of the theories. Um, so do you just want to describe the artifact for our listeners and tell us what this theory is? Yeah, so what I have here is a pin. Um, it's a KGB pin commemorating the 60th anniversary of um, the KGB's double O section. And um, it's, you know, sort of the traditional shape of a, of a shield here. And in the middle, we've got a star, a kind of sash or at the bottom, which has double O and then KGB in Russian letters and at the top 60, commemorating that 60th anniversary. I'm not 100% sure what the double O section was. I believe it might have had something to do with counterintelligence, but we've got, you know, it's, it's got the sword and the shield and all that kind of thing. But, um, <laughs> you know, again, it's, it's, it's very tempting to think that Fleming might have found his, inf- his inspiration for the double O section, which um, importantly is that section in MI6 with a license to kill. Uh, that's how you earn your double O. Um, that, you know, maybe Fleming uh, was inspired by the KGB, but there are so many theories about the double O and where that <laughs> comes from that, uh, you know, this is it's a possibility. This might be one of them. It's a lovely artifact we have here but you know there are theories for example from Rudyard Kipling who had a story about an American train that was called uh, 007 (laughs) (laughs) Kipling of course also having written that famous story about Kim or the spy um, who we, we know Fleming would have read that you know, the, the oldest theory goes back to a 16th century English explorer John Dee who was said to have spied for Queen Elizabeth of England, who would sign his communiques with two circles and a sort of elongated seven. (laughs) The the circles apparently kind of, you know, a symbol for your eyes only, and the theory is that Fleming took that code after reading a biography of Dee. No evidence of that, but that's a theory. Um, The Zimmerman telegram famously uh, intercepted and decoded by British intelligence in 1917, helping to get America into World War I, was coded 0075. (laughs) Um, Apparently 007 was the international dialing code for the Soviet (laughs) Union. (laughs) I think this one is uh, quite interesting. (laughs) Uh, And then, of course, Georgetown and Washington, D.C., bastion for spies in the nation's capital, zip code for that to... Zero double oh seven. Now Fleming himself claimed in an interview, and I have to say Fleming said lots of contradictory things, things. contradictory things in interviews. <laughs> said he took the idea of the double O section from the fact that at the beginning of World War II, all top secret signal, signals from the Admiralty had a double O prefix. That sounds quite compelling to me. And I believe there's also a double O as part of SOE. That's the body created by Churchill, which did lots of sabotage abroad. And I think there was a, a double O involved in that. So I, I, it seems to me quite 
If I had to guess, I would say it was probably inspired by something from World War II, which offered a lot of inspiration for Fleming. That was when he worked in intelligence. But there are many other theories. I only named a few of them. I'm sure people listening to this um, may have heard of others as well. Uh, we don't really know. Um, there is no double O section in MI6, as far as I know. And there is no license to kill, uh, which is earned uh, by being an MI6 officer. In the, in the eyes only, that's something that, that comes from the real world, you know, for for your eyes only or for these people's eyes only or five eyes only. Mm -hmm. So it's only five countries that can, that people that are cleared that can view the information and so forth. I feel like it's a stroke of genius on Fleming's behalf and it's difficult to know whether this is just because I've been culturally conditioned into 007, but it seems to me that 007 just has a ring that, any other one just doesn't have 005, 006, 008, none of them. There's something about that number seven as well, right? Mm. Like it's almost a transcultural phenomenon where seven is seen as a magic number or a, a special kind of number for, for many different people in, in different cultures. But again, this could just be because I've been raised in the world of 007 that, that it makes sense to me. It's possible. I mean, Fleming is not a great writer, in my opinion. <laughs> no literary genius. But he did have a way with, um, with names, didn't he? I mean, I think some of his characters have fantastic names that we're all familiar with. Goldfinger, Hugo Drax, of course, some of the, the women's names. Scaramanga. Scaramanga. <laughs> um, he had, did have a, a, you could say maybe he had a way with words. Perhaps he he knew that that sort of you know, fell off the tongue in a very sort of engaging way. Thanks for listening to this episode of SpyCast. Remember that next week, we'll release part two of this special episode celebrating the 70th anniversary of James Bond. Please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have feedback, you can reach us by email at spycast at spymuseum.org or on Twitter at INTL Spycast. Coming up in next week's show. Bond was a naval officer, Commander Bond. That was, you know, Fleming... Um, Fleming was borrowing from what he knew. I think that's what's important. Um, and I think it must have been fun for Fleming to sort of revel in this idea that Fleming and his lifestyle in some way echoed Bond and his, and his lifestyle as well. If you go to our page, the cyberwire.com forward slash podcasts forward slash spycast, you can find links to further resources, detailed show notes, and full transcripts. I'm Aaron Dietrich, and your host is Dr. Andrew Hammond. The rest of the team involved in the show is Mike Mincy, Memphis Vaughn III, Emily Coletta, Afua Anakwa, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, and Jen Arben. This show is brought to you from the home of the world's preeminent collection of intelligence and espionage-related artifacts, the International Spy Museum.